I never fucked anybody over in my life. Didn't have a coat. You got that? All I have in this world is my balls and my word. And I don't break them up for no one. You understand? I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. I work for Kaiser Soze. You were this way, no, me, no. I work for Kaiser Soze. What is up, party people? Welcome to Admit One, your movie ticket. I am Jim, your host. Today we're going to be looking at Total Recall. First, let me just say, if you're a fan of Total Recall 2070, I'm sorry, I couldn't get to that. I did watch about five minutes of it, and it was bad. Like, really bad. It reminded me of those Canadian Robocop movies. You ever seen those? Maybe when we do Robocop, I'll talk about those too. There's four of them. I watched all four of them. This was worse. I don't know. Is is Canadian TV always like that or just terrible movie uh, versions of it? I don't know. And I I don't mean to knock Canadian television or Canadian movie making by any means because we have our fair share down here. I'm just curious. This is... These two movie versions are, 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 of those TV shows are really bad. Don't watch them. As kids, we grew up on Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, my brother idolizes him. And when he dies, like I, I get bummed out when celebrities die. I have never cried for a celebrity. My brother will cry when, when this man passes away. I don't know what I'll do, but he is a big part of our childhood. However, we never owned Total Recall. This was not one of the movies in our collection. We rented it occasionally. We had a cabin up in Crestline, which is like half hour, 45 minutes or so from Big Bear, California. And we'd go up there occasionally. We'd just, we'd rent movies and we'd go up there and watch them. Uh, Total Recall was one of those movies that we watched up there. We were always familiar with it. Like, I always knew the movie. But back then, you didn't have Amazon, so you couldn't just order the video. Yes, video, because back then, it was on these little plastic things. They're called VHS tapes. You had to rewind them when you're done with them. And it wasn't until the DVD boom of the early 2000s that I could really dive into the movie. Um, once once it came out, like I was on top of that shit. It came in like a little tin can with Mars on the top and his face. But when we were kids, like... I remember it because one of the first scenes is him him and um, Melina getting sucked out into Mars and their their face masks breaking. That face bulging gave me nightmares. A lot of movies did, really. <laughs> I'll talk about one. In one of the next couple of episodes, I'll talk about how uh, that movie gave me nightmares. And it really doesn't now when you look back onto it. It's not scary at all. But when you're little, <laughs> you don't know. And I always get giddy. Uh, because of Family Guy, whenever they say uh, the movie title in the movie itself, and, and of course they do that in this, um, and this movie is chock full of one-liners. It's some of Arnold's best. Depending on what soundboard you pull up of Arnold's voice, like this movie will dominate it. We'll talk about the remake in a minute, but this is one of those movies that I feel, if it were made today, it would have flopped. It doesn't mean it's a bad movie. I just think it really is a product of its time. At the time, it was the second most expensive movie ever made. It didn't flop back then, just because, like I said, it's a product of its time. That's what people were into. Just look at superhero movies of the late 80s and 90s, and even up until, like, 2000s uh, X-Men. Like, superhero movies weren't global blockbusters. And like I said... Just because I think it would flop today, which the remake did, doesn't make it not a good movie. I love this movie. The action is spectacular. The story is good. Can these fucking police sirens go away? I'm trying to record here. And the acting suffices. It's not great, but it is what it is. I don't remember who said it. I was reading a book. It's like the 100 best movies of all time. It was very subjective, but 
because Terminator 2 was in there, which it is a good movie, but I don't remember who said it, but Arnold Schwarzenegger is the best movie star ever. Not the best actor, the best movie star. So dissect that as you will. So like I said, it's a product of its time. And you can kind of tell, too, It's the TVs are big, <laughs> but they're full screen. They're not widescreen like we have now, and they're not flat. They were on the wall. I don't know if I'd call them flat. And there's also um, a kind of weird alien-predator connection here. Ronald Chassette and Dan O'Bannon wrote this movie, as well as Alien. And he actually, I, don't remember, I think it's Chassette wrote another movie we'll cover uh, in a couple of episodes. But I just think it's funny that they wrote this and Alien, and then Arnold was in Predator... And then, of course, we have our Alien vs. Predator, which come 14 years later. And I also think it's funny, like, Arnold was originally supposed to play Robocop, but they, if I remember correctly, couldn't quite make the schedules work. I don't remember what movie he passed to do, or he passed that to do for, but um, they wanted to work together, him and Verhoeven, so they got together for this. And while the remake definitely has a, a, a serious tone, it's hard to tell if this one is taking itself seriously or if it's just playing it fast and loose or if it's uh, the goofy vibes of the late 80s action movies. Um, it's hard to tell. Verhoeven has his own flair with stuff anyway, but that's where I stand with this. What I like about this movie, and most movies pre Oh Brother, Where Out Thou, is everything is bright and filterless but there's still a sense of escapism. Like it, I think that's what, and there's a video out there too, that kind of breaks down why, and there there will always be that uncanny valley, I think, um, where people can tell the difference between real and computer-generated stuff. I'm simplifying that tremendously, but you, you should get the idea. But the video explains why people, or, or why movies like Jurassic Park still look great because they're not heavily edited afterwards with filters and and things like that like it's natural lighting even though they're still directors of photography so they're setting up these shots to look like they do but it looks uh like a snapshot in time but it still offers that sense of escapism which is why i watch movies that's why i don't like when people blast movies for historical inaccuracies like they're not there to um, educate people, if you will. And again, I'm oversimplifying it, but I'm here to be entertained. I want to escape the shittiness of the real world. I don't care if that's not what really happened on the Titanic, or that's not really what the sky looked like on the Titanic. What's also interesting about this time period is when he goes in to recall, and they're asking him all those preliminary questions, she asks him his sexual orientation like it's no big thing. And no one had qualms with it back then that they could easily uh, spread to people. Like you can now with Twitter and Facebook and things like that. Um, just to be clear, I don't care what your sexual orientation is. If you do, um, that's cool. Um, I think you're wrong, but that's it's not the place for this. The revolution on Mars could be an allegory for actual struggles in the real world, but it's kind of pushed aside. I don't know if it wasn't popular at the time or 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 what but i think if the remake had kind of uh, focused in on some of that maybe it would have been respected a little more like i said i we'll talk about it in a minute but i i like the remake i think it's unjustly crucified if you will you'll notice too um which i kind of think is a nice little touch i love when people do this in movies like whenever there's advertising for soft drink on earth it's coke Whenever they're on Mars, it's Pepsi. Um, but you'll notice that Barks, the, the Barks can hasn't changed in, uh, what is it now? 26 years? And what also I didn't realize, the composer was criticized for not having a theme for this movie. It's more commonplace now, because I think soundtracks are coming, becoming more subtle. There's a video going around right now, and I refuse to watch it, but it supposedly breaks down why Marvel movies don't have memorable scores, which I think is silly, because you have something as good as Marvel movies, they're 
there's 13, 14 of them now, and they're extremely consistently good. And that's what you're going to pick apart is their scores. They're not bad scores. I kind of get that they're not memorable. I don't own any of them, but that's what you're going to nitpick. I don't know. I just think that it's funny that back then this guy was criticized for it. He wasn't a monster. He was just ahead of his time. And I would like to see more of the aliens, too. Anybody else want to see that? You get this cool backstory, um, somewhat, of them building this stuff. And then you can see their handprint. Like, what did they actually look like? Give me, like, a prequel set, you know, thousands of years earlier with, with those aliens. I'd watch that. So now on to the big argument of the movie. Is it a dream? What do you guys think? Everything leading up to the transition at the end there points to it not being a dream, at least to me. Like his, when he's working, his friend glares at him when he brings it up. Like, how dare you? The recall associate tries to steer him away from Mars. His wife tries to stop him, but was going to recall part of the dream. And then also when he's at recall... Melina shows up on the monitor, pre-injection, you know, as one of the ladies that he can pick. And subsequently he does pick her. But when they're on Mars, so that was an argument for it not being a dream. So, but when they're on Mars, here's kind of an argument for it being a dream. The doctor describes to him what's going to happen to his brain. And he's sweating the entire time like he's nervous. So maybe that is, I don't know, maybe I'm getting him flip-flopped, but those are the arguments. And then once he shoots that guy, his wife doesn't continue to act all concerned that he didn't, or he won't come out of the dream. She immediately goes back into military mode. So I don't know, what do you guys think? It's fun to debate, so if you have a, an opinion nicely, you know, reach out to me on Twitter, let's talk about it. It's fun to debate. I don't think it has the same reaction as, say, Inception, but you know, I'm welcome to it. And of course, uh, they remade the movie in 2012 with Colin Farrell. This is one of those movies where I don't understand the hate for it. Before I started this podcast, I was doing um, a regular, or tried to make it regular, series of articles called Making the Case, where um, I would pick a movie that is mostly hated by everybody and kind of make the case against why it's, why I think it's good. Um, I never got to this one, but it was on my list. Is it because it remade a quote-unquote classic? I don't know. I mean, I I don't think... I think people come at remakes uh, from the wrong perspective. The, The best example is the Ghostbusters one. It doesn't harm the original. It doesn't change the original. It doesn't ruin your childhood. You know what ruins childhoods? I think you can guess. Are remakes always good? No. But the thing... John Carpenter's classic was a remake. The Magnificent Seven, which again got rebooted this year, which came out uh, at the time of this recording this weekend. That was remade from uh, Seven Samurai, I believe. I've never seen that one, so don't hold me against it if I said the title incorrectly. The Coen Brothers' True Grit was a quote-unquote remake. And I'll kind of talk about it in a minute, but when is it a remake? You know what I mean? This came at the tail end of Colin Farrell's resurgence. Um, starting with In Bruges as well, which is a great movie. If you've never seen that, I recommend you pause this podcast right now and go watch that movie. Maybe it's maybe people hate this movie because it's um, it was directed by Lynn Wiseman. I like him, by the way. He's not the best director, but I like him. Director slash creator of the Underworld series and that terrible Die Hard movie. But I like him. He knows his action. Maybe it's because of Brian Cranston's terrible wig. He must have been in the middle of Breaking Bad when he made this movie because that wig is atrocious maybe it's that weird ethan hawk cameo uh that's in the director's cut which is also strange and unnecessary i guess it's kind of interesting that he could have had plastic surgery but at the same time why would you go to that trouble and then i think cutting that was probably a good move it just doesn't make sense uh in the long run if he had plastic surgery to change his face you could always tell that guy that he's insane for thinking that he went or he is who he is you know what i mean well, this is actually Hauser over here because he doesn't look like you. Oh, shit, you're right. This is oddly one of those movies where they nailed this the CG. Uh, another weird one is another remake again, which wasn't as bad. Point Break. That's the computer-generated images in that are fantastic. They blend seamlessly. 
My favorite in this one, though, are the Robo Police. I would have seen, I'd like to have seen um, more of those. And again, like I said earlier, this one has a, a more serious tone. And the look of this is very Blade Runner-y, which I can see where it draws that inspiration. Um, same author of the source material. I don't know, I kind of like this future better than the than the original. Um, Recall also seems a little more shady as opposed to like a corporation, uh, which would explain like his need to keep it a secret, I guess. And also the dangers of it, of having a, a memory implant. But it can't, the movie can't quite see, seem to make up its mind um, in some respect. They have Robo Police, which I, like I said, were my favorite. But they also had regular police. They had magnetic cars that could fly around and drop from the sky, but they also had regular cars. They had phones in their hands, but they also had regular cell phones. And then it, I, I have to come back to my original comment. Is it a remake if the source material is a book? Is True Grit a remake if it's based off the book? I don't know. I guess that's a debate to have. This one kind of has a gray area, though, in the case of... of because it really... It lifts stuff directly from its predecessor that wasn't in the book. And actually, Jessica Biel tried to make that argument that it's not a remake of the movie, but a reinterpretation of the book, which is only 24 pages. But her character only appears in the original movie, as do a couple of other characters and scenarios. So it kind of it straddles a weird line. You know what I mean? They never go to Mars, even though in the book they go to Mars, which is fine. That's I'm not knocking it for that, although it would have been cool to go to Mars, but that's that's neither here nor there. Um, and it's also interesting if you watch the credits at the beginning, it says it's based on the book, but later on it says it's based on the original movie. So maybe they had to give both credits because of um, the way that they're lifting characters and things like that. I don't know, but I did love the take on the story. Um, and the backstory to their whole world. Um, I like that it was a chemical war as opposed to nukes. And it's kind of hard to keep track of where you're at, but I liked how they had both, you know, the rich side of it on one side of the world and then kind of the slums on the other. Um, that would have been, or, or that is kind of a cool contrast to each other. But like I said, it's hard to keep track of where you're at. Um, this one isn't overly homage it's not a word, but I'm making it up. Uh, unlike Terminator 4, which I like too, but the homages in that one are just out of control. You know, like he mentions wanting to go to Mars. Hello. Uh, you get the lady in there with the three boobs. Um, a couple of other things. That malfunctioning helmet. Um, the reality in this one is a little more obvious. I believe in this one, beyond a doubt, that everything is actually happening, unlike the other one. Um, they try to trick you, but it, they don't do a very good job of it. Having it be a dream or reality is not a focus in this, like it is in the original, or or like Inception 2. Um, not that it was heavy-handed in the original, but it is more prevalent, uh, for sure. It sparked more debate, I would say, than this one. Uh, and here's my proof. His friend tries to take uh, tries to get him to take the gun and shoot the girl, right? But when, when he declines, he snatches that gun out of her hand. I'm more inclined to believe something like what happened in the original, where he just shows up, there's no police, he's sweating his ass off because he's nervous. And in this, he doesn't explain what's going to happen to his mind, really. And it's never touched on again. I th and so in this one, I think it was more them trying to trick him than the movie trying to trick us, if that makes sense. So again, I apologize to fans of Total Recall 2070. Um, I wasn't going to sit through all of that. If there are any fans out there, are you a fan? Let me know. So that does it for this week's episode. I thank you for tuning in. Are you the police? No, we're musicians. I work for Kaiser Soda. Because it's way no I work for Kaiser Soda. Because he's way no